This is Pat Iyer with Legal Nurse Podcast. I have the privilege of bringing to you today Anna Ramirez, who is a legal nurse consultant located in Arizona. Anna and I have connected through her work as an expert witness. Anna, welcome to the show. Hi, everybody. Anna has a background, and I think, Anna, you must work about 90 hours a week because you work partly in a rehabilitation facility, partly with the same corporate umbrellas, home health care service, and you have a busy legal nurse consulting practice that includes expert witness work as well as life care planning and probably some other services as well. So congratulations on being one of the people who has been able to figure out how to balance this. How do you do that, by the way? Thank you, thank you so much. Um, first, I love both things. I like being a nurse in the hospital and I like being a legal nurse. And I believe both specialties are connected because you become a great legal nurse for the knowledge that you get in the floor interacting with patients and with the medical team, with the family members, and everything gives you a different perspective. When you come to work with attorneys, the picture of the events are totally different of what you see in the hospital. And that is why the main reason why they hire you as a legal nurse, just to give them all the opinions and knowledge that you get in the hospital that they don't have access. Rehabilitation nurse is one of those areas that you really enjoy. It's really rewarding. See a patient that come to you unable to talk, unable to express, unable to eat, swallow, walk, go to the toilet like a normal person will do every day. It can be really challenging for those patients that have disabilities and limitations. And that is what stick me to my full-time job. I do nursing, no because of money. Um, I have a good income in my legal nurse business. It is because I love being a rehabilitation nurse and I love being with my patients. You know, I was thinking about, as you were talking about a woman I interviewed for my Writing to Get Business podcast who wrote a book about mindset, and she had a, a sudden stroke that left her without the ability to speak. And she used her techniques to rehabilitate her brain. She was already in that mode of knowing how to rejuvenate her brain. And when she had the stroke, the only words that she could say were her name and damn. So within about three days, she was back to talking using those techniques. And I could imagine for the people around her, how rewarding that would have been to watch her recover that rapidly, because to me, that was a phenomenal, rapid uh, regaining of her ability to speak. It's not typical in, in my experience. And You've got tons more experience than I do in terms of watching stroke patients struggle with trying to be able to speak again. Yeah, it's, um, it's challenging, especially like um, English is not my first language. Most of my patients, they are primary English speakers. So somebody that has difficulties to articulate words in another language can be really challenging. But this job is about soul and about being able to encourage people no matter what language you speak and no matter what are the challenging. And I actually identify with my patients that are unable to express themselves because I leave it too. When I came to the United States, I was unable to communicate it. And you can have like that feeling uh, and you understand them better. And I say, most of the time when they get really angry or frustrated because they are unable to express themselves. So I kind of like I use a joke, oh, I don't speak English neither. And they just start laughing immediately. And that creates a connection between me being the rehab nurse because 
I know what we have to do. I know that I have to show charts to communicate it with them, indicate with pictures, sign, help them articulate words, um, and figure it out the idea that they want to tell you. And sometimes it's th simple things like I need water or I want to go to the toilet. And those are things that um, are simple for a person that is able to communicate it, but for them, when they are able to articulate those words, it's a big deal. And day one, you don't get nothing out of their, their mouth. And after couple speech therapies, you are able to see them smiling again. And that is, that is my payment as a nurse and as a rehab nurse, actually. Well, let's talk about how you use your knowledge as a rehab nurse in legal cases. I know from my experience, there are malpractice suits that arise in rehab areas, and there are many patients who are injured who go from acute care to rehab and then to home. How does your unique background as a rehab nurse give you an asset when it comes to working with an attorney? Okay, an attorney came to you, let's use like a motor vehicle accident as, as an example. The other nurses will give an attorney an explanation about the mechanism of injury, about the injuries that the patient suffered, what are the tests that shows those injuries, what are the needs that the patient may have, or the client for the attorney, patient for the nurse always. Um, the rehabilitation nurse will give the attorney a different picture of what's going on because we will give them what is the injury about and what are the real consequences of this injury. For example, a patient that has an injury between the vertebral six and the vertebral seven, C7 on the cervical spine. We have limitations to grasp objects. We have um, unable to control uh, the bowel and the bladder. We have weakness on the arms and the legs, and some of them can have some paralysis. So this is what the doctor will say, and this is what the other nurses will say but the rehabilitation nurse will say, this patient will be unable to stand up in the morning, to walk to her job, to do the activities of daily living, to play with the kids on the park. This client of yours lose her life because of this car accident. And our goal, your goal as an attorney is obtain the, the money to take care of that patient in the future. And my goal as a rehabilitation nurse and legal nurse is ensure that you get the better settlement that you can think about it because that will guarantee the patient medical care in the future. Here in the United States, different to other countries, the healthcare is about money sometimes and the patients have the resources that they are able to pay. There are a lot of free resources, but the best ones are those that the patients are able to pay. So we teach the attorneys and rehabilitation nurses um, the consequences of the injury. What are the limitations of that patient? What that function that the patient was having before do not have it now, and what are the consequences that he's unable to perform that specific activity of daily living. Like walking is a big thing because the patient that we is unable to walk, it will need physical therapy to keep the strength of the muscles and to keep movement and to avoid spasms that are really painful. Our patients that have pains maybe for life that will require a physical therapy that will require a, um, medical devices like wheelchairs, transfer board, uh, all those equipments that help them to move inside the house and outside the house to learn a new life with limitations. And that is what rehabilitation is, nursing is about, teaching 
how to live with limitations. I don't think any of us want to learn how to live with limitations, but some of us don't have a choice. And that's what the legal system focuses on. Speaking of limitations, how does your background as a rehab nurse influence what you do as a life care planner? Well, this is what's really challenging and curious for me, because the rehabilitation nurses, we don't need the life care planner training to be able to do the test offered by the Life Care Planner Association. We don't need it because that is what we do all day long. We plan the people life and we talk about solutions. We teach them what are the alternatives that they have to, to do something that they need to do in their normal life and in the future. And we plan all that with the resources that we have available and the resources that we don't have available. And because the, the main thing is the patient. And that is what we do all day long, starting from first thing in the morning. For example, when I go to the hospital, we help the patient stand up from the bed in the morning. We do everything that a normal person would do brush the teeth, clean the face, get the shower, go to the toilet, take breakfast. That's what you do in the morning. So a person that is unable to walk, eat, or swallow is unable to do these simple things. So we teach them solutions. Those solutions require resources, require a physical therapy, a speech therapy, occupational therapy, require a nurse that is able to ensure that your skin has integrity and you don't get any complication all the road through the rehabilitation process because people that are limited, unable to move, they are at high risk of complications. And I believe more than teaching, we ensure that the patients walk the rehabilitation journey in the safest way, way as possible. And um, that is what a life care plan they do. We use the nursing process to be able to ensure this. And that is what makes us stronger and unique in the legal world because we are unable to add by, like nurse say, assess, diagnose, plan, intervene, and evaluate all the things that these people need in the future. And that is, uh, it, how can I say, it's an incredible tool for the attorneys to obtain the settlement. And like I say, this picture has two sides because we work on the plantings and in the defense side. In the defense side, we, we try to, to judge other nurses' life care plans or medical cost projections, but we basically, we center in the patient. For us, it's not about the fight on the legal work. It is about the patients. We are nurses at the end, and the nurses are all about the patients. We are experts, but we are no higher guns that they call us. We are nurses, and that is what makes our profession superior, superior in this kind of area of patient care and public trust. And can you comment on the risk for falls, because when you talk about safety and maintaining safety, and I think about the rehabilitation cases that came through my legal nurse consulting business, the issue of falls came up fairly often in the rehab setting. I would say it was probably the most common type of incident that brought a family to an attorney. We want the people to be mobile so that they gain strength and they get better. And yet by being mobile, there are risks involved. So how do you weigh out those types of issues? Well, yes, you are totally correct. Paul is one of the number, number one cases that we get. And it is because um, there is always, always a risk and there is several factors involved. Sometimes, first, the screening. As a nurses, we always have to screen and properly assess our patient. And that will be the main reason to avoid a lot of falls, the proper screening and the proper scoring of the patient, but also 
the use of clinical judgment. Because even if your screening say this patient is not a full risk because he's able to walk, he's able to not use the walker, do not have an IV hanging, this patient is not alert oriented. So he don't know what's going on. He do not have any awareness of the danger or he doesn't see that if he stand up and he get dizzy, he can fall. So you have to be able to use your clinical judgment to make sure that you understand that even if this person do not score to be a full risk, it is obviously a full risk because if you leave him alone, he will tend to jump from the bed because he do not recognize the bed is to sleep and he believes it's for something else. So things like that are, are, um, are things that has a lot of influence in, in the falls at the hospital and also staffing is a good thing. Sometimes the hospital do not provide the, um, the patient ratio like supposed to be and nurses get really busy running around. Other times because the family members come and they want to help and then they try to transfer the patient and they don't manage the proper technique yet. Other times it can be because maybe a narcotic pain medication can make people fall, can make people really dizzy. Other time can be for equipment errors, like a Hoyer that is a malfunction, or somebody that is using a 400 pound Hoyer on a 500 pound patient. Obviously this Hoyer will don't hold the patient and it will cause patient injury, staff injuries and fall. So, and I believe the rules are in the hospitals and in the homes to be followed because those rules are there because there was accidents before. Sometimes as a healthcare providers and as family members and as main caregivers of the patient, we don't think in the consequences of what we are doing. And a, job, a, a fall can cause injuries, serious injuries and people death. Actually, the American Nursing Association has been releasing a book about mobility and transfer. And, and it is because of all these uh, accidents that happen. Uh, and it was, that is a resource to teach nurses how to prevent falls. And I believe for us is, is one of the main things that we have to avoid a fall because we are there to ensure safety. And the hospital has a screening for falls. That is something that we have to look in the cases. The Morse fall score is the score that will tell you how, how bad this patient balance and mobility is and what is the risk that this patient has to fall. This is a Morse, uh, the Morse fall score is used all the way of the continuum from home health to rehabilitation hospital to the other hospitals. Uh, other things to look in the medical record when we got these cases, it is about the limitations of the patient. Obviously, a patient that is paraplegic, it has a higher risk for falling than a patient that is able to walk. Mental status, like I said before, medications are important things that we look inside the medical record because those are the tools that we give it to plaintiff to win the case. But that's also all the tools that we look on the defense side that are the resources that it was in, in place for this patient to do no fall. There is avoidable falls and there is unavoidable falls. So the defense is trying to get all those evidence on the medical record to prove that this fall is unavoidable. And the plaintiff, you know, is trying to look every single evidence of the medical record to prove that this fall was avoidable. So and here is what we are nurses in the middle of both divisions, giving just the facts that we are in the medical record. We do not go on the legal fight, we just talk about fights and what the medical record show. We just give it the evidence for them to apply the law. Now you'll hear about our upcoming Legal Nurse Consulting Conference 
taking place September 23, 24, and 25, 2021, in your home. You'll have the opportunity to meet your colleagues, to be inspired, to be educated, and to be motivated by our speakers, all coming to you in the comfort of your home. You'll have an opportunity to get recharged, renewed, and revitalized. Don't miss this opportunity to be part of the fourth conference that Barbara Levin and I have planned for legal nurse consultants. Get all the details and secure your spot at lnc.tips forward slash September 2021 virtual. And now, before we continue the podcast, I'd like you to meet one of the speakers who will be at the program. Have you been curious to know a key to winning your case? I'm Barbara Levin, and I am hosting the fourth virtual Legal Nurse Consulting Conference with Patricia Iyer. The conference dates are September 23, 24, 25, 2021. Today, I am joined with our Platinum Conference sponsor, Rihanna Bonnell from High Impact, whose company specializes in legal exhibits, medical illustrations, legal animations, and interactive presentations. Rihanna started working in the litigation visual space in 2012 and soon discovered how much she excels at translating medical and scientific data into understandable visuals. Her academic background gave her the skills to conduct appropriate research and quickly synthesize complex ideas. Brianna is going to present Visualizing the Case, Simplifying the Medical Complexities. Welcome, I look forward to hearing what you're gonna present about. Thank you so much for the introduction. I'm really excited to be speaking at the conference and to explain how legal nurses can really play a key role in cases in both consulting on the liability in a medical malpractice case, explaining some complex medical uh, procedures and or conditions, as well as showing how damages can effectively be built up in a case. Uh, during the session, we're going to look at a few different case studies that's going to show how a legal nurse may have been involved in the case, how their consult led to some accuracy and uh, basically some more explanation as to how some medical conditions happened, how standard of care may have been violated, and how that ultimately led to a very successful result for their attorney. I think it's really terrific that you're working now with legal nurses and that they help you with navigating and also building up your demonstrative evidence. Yes, they've played a key role, especially in some of our medical malpractice cases with birth injuries and things where they have specialties in looking at fetal heart strips or really taking a look, a uh, closer dive at the records and seeing when there's inconsistencies with charting or when something doesn't match up with the vitals being read correctly. And I understand that your company is a national company. You have been involved in trials from coast to coast, north to south, and you actually have an award-winning team of legal strategists, animators, forensic experts, and physicians, as well as nurses that help you custom these legal exhibits and maximize the value of your verdicts and settlements. That's correct. We have a team of medical illustrators, animators that have uh, master's degrees frequently in biomedical visualization. We also have a physician on staff as well as a radiologist that really help us dive into uh, more complex procedures or take a look at some um, films that may be hard for the average person to interpret. And um, we really just work to ensure accuracy in how everything's presented. Well, we're so excited to have you on board as our platinum sponsor. Please join our LNC Success Conference, September 23, 24, 25, 2021. Please see the link below, lnc.tips forward slash September 2021 virtual. We look forward to seeing you. Yes, and, and that's one of the challenges because the attorney may come into that case with a very different perspective about what happened. Maybe the family or the patient explain the circumstances of the fall, and yet the medical record has a different set of facts 
about what took place. I would imagine that you spend a fair amount of time explaining rehabilitation records to attorneys. What can our listener, who is most likely a legal nurse consultant, learn about the differences in the rehab chart from a hospital chart? What are some of the primary differences that you encounter? Well, the, the rehabilitation chart is uh, very different because we have patients that are medically stable, but have certain level of disability and they uh, are unable to function on the normal way. It is an error to think that we just work with old people. We don't. We work with children, teenagers, with all the ages. We are a really general division of nurses, and we can practice rehabilitation and different settings. But inside the rehabilitation hospital, we have the dysphagia screening. We are able to tell if the patient is able to swallow or not and what are the things that we have to put in place to ensure that this patient do not aspirate. So, and all that, it gets on the medical record. So we, we put the, the interventions that we are may, make every day, like the coordination with the kitchen, the coordination with the nutritionist, the coordination with the speech therapy, the rehab nurse is the middle of the system. So we coordinate with everybody. And our goal is one, stop the aspiration of this patient and make sure this patient remain medically stable and without pain during the rehabilitation process. And this is what the medical record is about. It's showing all these interventions. If you have a case, somebody that chopped with a pill and aspirate some kind of food in the lung and in the ICU on there, rehabilitation hospital, then the legal nurse will have to look on the medical record. What are the interventions that was not in place in the dysphagia screening, in the dysphagia interventions, that this accident happened? It was because the family member came and gave a sandwich to the patient, or is because there was some kind of error and the kitchen bring a sandwich for the patient that was MPO or something like that, you know, that was not having orders to swallow by mouth and it, it was supposed to be feeding through a feed tube and somebody give a sandwich to this patient, the patient end choking. Some of the patients, they don't have the judgment to know what they can do and that what cannot do. So in this case, it would be the nurse fault. So we have to make sure that this doesn't happen. So we have to ensure that we remove all the sandwich that we talk with the family, that we educate it, that we have signs in the room that indicate this patient cannot eat, that we coordinate with the kitchen and the nutritionist, that way everybody's in the same page. When uh, there is also different kind of screenings in the rehabilitation setting, like infectious disease screening, a skin assessment to ensure the skin is intact and we do not get any kind of complication. We got precautions that we take to ensure there is no contamination of diseases between patients. Um, there is a fall risk assessment that we do, but our fall risk assessment is a little bit different to the fall risk assessment in the hospital because we do coordinate with physical therapy we do score them regarding physical therapy opinion because they are the experts of the area of transfer and mobility. Uh, we participate with the patients in therapy so we are able to know and learn what are the main weakness on this area. There is also, uh, we have areas for vaccinations, areas for prevention, but the most important area for the documentation of the medical record is the team conference, because it shows the coordination of care with all the areas of the rehabilitation process inside the hospital, and the coordination with case management, because the goal is to discharge this patient to a setting that he can either continue with the rehabilitation process 
and he will be safe doing so. Sometimes families are resistant to send patients to an assisting living facility because they love this person too much and they don't they want it at home, but going to home is not the safer things to do until this person gets more functional. And um, there is areas for what the insurance cover and what are the time that we have to make this person strong enough to go safe because sometimes the insurance just pay two weeks to be in the hospital and two weeks is not enough. So we have to ensure that we have all these kind of interventions of place and coordinations. And especially if we are not agree with somebody discharging because we cannot be agree, we can do an appeal to the insurance and we can buy a little bit more time for this person to reach the maximum amount of functionality that can have to go home or to the assisting living facility. Uh, there is areas for uh, bowel. Bowel, bowel and bladder are two things that are really important in rehab because they are related to the skin and they can, the person that is incontinent can have pressure ulcers or other complications on the skin and can end in the ICU for osteomyelitis or something like that. So we make sure we train the patients. If these patients go through a process of training to be able to pee, poop in the toilet, and if they are not functional, uh, available to do it on the toilet, we teach them techniques like a suppository to poop at the same time every single day. That way they are able to work and do things without being scared of having a continent episode, or we teach them how to spray catheter themselves, and we teach the family how to spray catheter, that way they are able to take care of the bladder and avoid urinary tract infections that has complications and people in the ICU very frequently because of sepsis. You know, Anna, I think that the person watching this podcast on our YouTube channel, which is Legal Nurse Business or listening to it, has a greater appreciation of all of the complexities. I think we've just scratched the surface of some of the things that rehabilitation nursing looks at, manages, and how that analysis impacts the care that people receive, whether they're injured at a facility or they are injured and go to the facility because of the injury. How can our listener or our viewer find out more about the services that you offer? Well, uh, my phone number is 602-687-0122. My clients know that I answer all the time. Uh, I also, you can email me at Anna at ScorpioLegalNurse.com and my webpage is www.ScorpioLegalNurse.com. Scorpio like the sign. Yes, Scorpio like the sign, not scorpion like the fatal venomous insect that lives in the desert, but Scorpio, yes. not scorpion. <laughs> Well, thank you for sharing your time with us. I know that our listeners have become more enlightened about rehabilitation nursing as a result of this conversation and that you provide life care planning services and expert witness services related to rehabilitation nursing. Thank you for yes. being on the show, Anna. Thank you for the opportunity and thank you for watching. And for you who is watching or listening, thank you for being here. Please be sure to go to your audio platform of choice and leave a rating or a review for Legal Nurse Podcast. We are especially interested in comments that you want to give about the show or about this episode. If you are watching this on our YouTube channel, leave a comment below this video and tell us what you think. Give us a thumbs up or a thumbs down. Give us some feedback and interaction and be sure to come back next week for the next episode of Legal Nurse Podcast. This is Pat Iyer with Legal Nurse Podcast and Valerie Lane, who is coming to us from California, 
Valerie has had a, a varied career and nursing is a second career for her. Valerie, can you tell our viewer on our Legal Nurse podcast YouTube channel, which is Legal Nurse Business, or the people watching this program on our audio channels, what are some of the things that we covered in your podcast? Well, we talked about uh, various aspects of a nursing career. Uh, we also talked about uh, starting in legal nurse consulting and the pathway that extends from taking that first step. Uh, we talked about perseverance and persistence in that journey. Um, we also talked about, which I think is really important, is partnering with uh, a mentor in a mastermind program if possible um, to provide uh, a social network with as a legal nurse consultant and to develop your um, to develop your strengths and confidence in seeking out attorneys and um, contacting them to, for, to, to obtain cases. And Valerie has extensive experience as a legal nurse consultant, a total of 27 years. She shared some of her wisdom in this podcast. Be sure to watch Valerie's program. You'll get some nuggets of wisdom and I think inspiration. Valerie has taken a very deliberate approach in building her career, and she'll share that approach with you in the podcast. Thank you, Valerie. Thank you, Pat.